Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Wow, today is Saturday already. And as many of you know, Saturday Nightmares live, 12 a.m. I hope to see you all there. But that's not why we're here right now. We are here for today's first upload. Before we get into it, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost you a cent. Click that like button. takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things, they really do help this channel to continue to grow and go, and they really do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? Before we get into today's upload, I just want to give you guys a heads up. It is graphic, and it is very disturbing. So... Uh, viewer discretion or listening discretion is advised. Okay, guys, as many of you know, and I've said it numerous times, when I receive emails from subscribers and or people who just want to uh, share theories and video clips and stuff like that, what I do is I go through my email and, um, probably three or four times a day. And I will star those, put them in the starred box and delete the, the junk email, whether, you know, Lowe's credit card or, you know, insurance, mutual life insurance, whatever, you know, just Netflix, just the stupid emails that we all get. And, um, after I'm done doing that, I, I usually put them in the star box for a couple days and then I go through them and start to answer people back or watch the videos and stuff like that. It's just easier for me to do it that way because I get a lot of emails during the day from subscribers and or just junk mail. Well, this gentleman sent me an email um, on the 22nd and uh, I responded back on the 25th um, he then emailed me back and said you know I'd really like to talk with you uh, Here's my phone number. Let's set up a time and date. So we set up uh, this evening, which it's um, Friday, the 27th. And uh, we spent about four hours on the phone together. And I'm laying the, I'm going to lay it all out for you. And uh, it was, uh, it was probably one of the hardest phone conversations I ever had in my life. So <clears throat> the man is, his name is Jesse. Uh, that is his real name. And I will not share his last name. He is born and bred West Virginian. Wife, son, 1988. He lived in a very poverty-stricken area, um, 
you know, it was hard to make ends meet, but he did. He worked countless hours, odd jobs here and there, doing whatever he needed to do for his wife and son. Um, he had bought an, uh, a home from his grandmother, and he, he bought his grandmother's home. Um, his wife worked at a grocery mart. <clears throat> This is about two hours after the conversation, so I'm a little shaky still. And uh, those of you who read the community post um, know what I'm talking about. This is literally the hardest conversation I ever had. I had tears, or yeah, tears welling up most of the conversation with him. And, and a lot of laughs too, actually. It was a really an emotional conversation with Jesse. So 1988, his son is nine years old. And uh, which is crazy, because in 88, I was 12. So we were about pretty close to the same age. And um, he because he worked so much and so many like hours doing whatever, garage work, farm work, um, just so he made sure that his family had what they, they needed, you know, and, and the little bit of uh, creature comforts they could afford. When he had time off, he would spend it usually camping with his wife and kid, his son. And because he felt like that was the, the best chance of bonding the, you know, teach him how to fish, teach him how to track, teach him, you know, just basic getting outdoors, breathing the fresh air, getting away from, you know, just the, the cartoons and, you know, it was well before the internet. <clears throat> and um, they had this little area that they would go to along this little creek um, that was right on the West Virginia, Pennsylvania border. Uh, Marshall County, West Virginia, and the Rich Hill Township. Pennsylvania. Now, there's also a wildlife management area out there. And uh, it's not, le not really illegal and not really legal to camp there. But different times, you know, we're talking 35 years ago. And um, so, you know, it, it wouldn't be like nowadays where you know, uh, NCON or DEC state trooper, whoever would come in and be like, you know, you got to get out of here. You're going to jail. This was different, you know? And, um, so they, they set up camp. It was the summer of 1988. They set up camp. It was him, his son and his wife. And, uh, first and foremost, I, <laughs> he, has only shared this with a very select few people. Um, his wife took her life in 1997 um, because of the hardships and trauma that, that was endured after this camping trip. Uh, his family knows about it, obviously, and a very few select friends. So he really had, uh, he hated me. <laughs> he, he said it right out for the first five minutes of our conversation. I really hated you, Jeff. I hated how you were upbeat and the shall we and this and that. He said, but, you know, 
I, I watched other channels. I'd, I'd jump over to your channel every once in a while um, just to hear what you were doing, hear, hear some information, this and that. And after listening to you and getting past the shall we and the upbeatness and this and that, he said, you know, I really felt like you were a decent individual. Um, then, of course, he heard about me having custody of my daughters and raising the girls by myself and this and that. And he, he said, you know, it took me a long time to even want to even reach out to anybody. He goes, but I never thought it would be you. And um, which was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> how do you how do you uh, respond to that? Right. So anyway, he hates. He listens to certain, he listens to channels, but he doesn't listen pretty much to the people that are talking, the hosts or whatever you want to call us, researchers. I'm a researcher. I view myself first and foremost as a researcher. Um, the first night they are set up, they are pretty much right against the West Virginia, Pennsylvania border probably could have spit across it. Probably like, uh, 40 feet from this little Creek. And, uh, this, this spot has, they've been going to this spot for a very long time. It's not anything new for them. Um, he used to go to the spot before his son was born. And uh, there's always been this kind of talk amongst his family uh, about the dog man. Um, they they didn't, never called it dog man. They called it werewolf. And he never really thought they transformed because you know if you think about it a transformation is very very unlikely uh muscles would be destroyed bone structures but anyway that's just what they called it they didn't have a name they didn't have dog man so it was a werewolf um they'd hear him out in the woods or cat him out and uh his family knew he had been warned but he had never seen anything. So they set up camp um, in an old kind of beat up truck. And it had one of those uh, back shells kind of where you could open the tailgate and then open the hatch. And um, you, you could go in there and not get wet. I don't know what they're called. Cabs? Cabs. And... Um, they would put their son in there uh, camping. You know, he'd have his sleeping bag. They'd lay a, like an egg egg crate out, put his sleeping bag in there. Um, and they'd store stuff just because they felt it, it safer him being up. They could shut the tailgate. Of course, their tent is right close to um, the truck. They had, you know collapsible table when when they went they went camping you know um they didn't want to eat on the ground of course they you know they they weren't rich but they had they had what they they needed and a little bit of what they wanted um they were comfortable when they camped so the first night went real smooth uh they got there and set up um did a little fish in and they had whatever. He doesn't remember obviously what they ate, but they had probably hot dogs or hamburgers or something and went to bed. And the next day, it's a, it's a beautiful Saturday morning and uh, the son wakes up the mom and dad says, you know, what are we doing today? Where can we go fishing? Can we do this? Can we do that? You know, 
just full of energy. And so they have breakfast <clears throat> and uh, they start, you know, the day. He, he says, let's go, let's go for a little hike. You know, we'll, we'll check out the area, um, see what's changed since we've been here last summer, you know? And, uh, so they do, um, just the, the, the son and the dad go out and they're probably away from camp. The mom, you know, sit, sat back, she's reading a book, you know, getting out of the house, and you know getting outside getting some fresh air um not really getting away from her son but you know her son's with with her husband and they're having fun so she doesn't have to worry about the the young boy so she's probably back at camp reading and this and that well when they end up coming back the the son and dad jesse uh, his wife is just shooken right up. And uh, he says, you know, Carol, what is wrong with you? What, what, you, you're pale white. You look like you saw a ghost. And she's insisting that they leave. She's like, I want to leave. I don't feel safe here. Um. This is 3 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, it's not even, we're talking four, five more hours till till dark. And she is trembling. Now, they apparently went away from the Pennsylvania border and went up into this kind of like little area where the creek widens out pretty close to the uh wildlife management area um she had been cleaning up camp getting some water from the creek getting some dishes done and she on the pennsylvania side by the creek observed this large wolf it was quadruped and but it was the size of a, a a donkey you know not as big as a horse but not as small as the biggest dog so in between a donkey and um it doesn't do anything it just watches her from the opposite side of the creek on the opposite side of the border, which is an imaginary line, you know, and um, it kind of watches her as she's gathering this water and kind of just turns and takes off into the woods of Pennsylvania. She immediately runs back to her camp and is just waiting for her son and husband to get back to camp so they can pack up and leave. Jesse then convinces her to stay. It was probably just a wolf. Um, probably wolf wolves came down from, you know, the Appalachia down north, you know, from north. Who knows? Um, Obviously, it didn't come into our camp and it didn't attack you, but, you know, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Well, his wife could see something in this wolf's, air quotes, eyes that just pointed intelligence. And that's what scared her the most was the intelligent look in its eyes and then its size. So he, Jesse, convinces her that it's good. They're fine. Not to worry about it. You know, we've been here before our son was born together. 
will be coming long after he's graduated from school and this is our spot. We're not going to get scared off. You know, it's a wolf. So a couple hours goes by, the tension just kind of dies down. Um, she didn't, obviously she didn't forget about it, but it's now kind of in the back of her mind. Um, Jesse really didn't pay much mind to it because he didn't see it. Uh, he believed his wife, but he he didn't see it, so he was not really mindful of it um he had a firearm with him um not, he he, <laughs> he wishes he had brought in a different firearm with him but he did have a firearm with him um just not as powerful as it should have been. And um, he had just brought something for snakes. And if, you know, he needed to scare off something, he could just shoot in the air or at it if it was a wild animal and scare it. He had a little 22 pistol. Um, because once again, he and his wife had been coming here for years uh you know they the, the son is nine and they'd been coming here probably 12 13 years prior or not prior but you know four years prior so at least 12 or 13 years now and never had anything never saw any people never had a thing go wrong so She's doing a little better now. It's in the back of her mind. They're having, you know, the, listening to the radio. Um, the son's doing his marshmallows. And, you know, just after dinner, just hanging out. Um, they've got a five-gallon bucket that they would put their silverware and camping um, plates in that had some water in it to let it soak. Uh, Jesse says, you know, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get some more water and we'll get these dishes done. After the little guy's done doing his marshmallows, he can hit the hay and We'll have a couple of cocktails by the fire and we'll enjoy ourselves and maybe have a little quiet time to ourselves, me and you. And uh, hint, hint. And she said, yeah, and so get, get him ready for bed. And, you know, so he goes down to the, the creek and gets some water, some fresh water um, to heat up and, you know, do the dishes in this this five gallon bucket as he's walking out towards this creek it's still saturday evening you know about nine o'clock um he can hear kind of something in front of him but off in the distance rather large uh almost kind of mimicking his steps or walking with him but in front of him, kind of watching every move that he makes. And he feels it. And he sees off in the distance these kind of orangish, fiery eyes, he says. Um, and he really can't distinguish where it is because he went the creek kind of neanders through this area of West Virginia and then into Pennsylvania and then neanders back into Pennsylvania or excuse me, West Virginia. So he gets his water and he's like, what, what the hell is that? You know, I've never seen anything like that out here. 
And um, he, like I said, doesn't really pay it any mind because he's not scared off. He's been here. He's, he goes back to camp and doesn't say a thing to anyone. Just kind of forgets about it. He's thinking, you know, hey, we'll get the kid put to bed, have a couple of cocktails, and we can unwind and just relax and listen to the radio. Um, and that's that's eventually what, what they start doing. And he has, you know, a drink. They're sitting, him and his wife are sitting by the fire. And the tailgate's closed. The cab... Uh, kind of upper part is open so some air can get in but when they go to bed they're going to close it and latch it so the little boy is safe um as they're standing or sitting there by the fire uh, they're kind of propped up against this like log thing and he can see the eyes again, these just fiery orange eyes out in the distance. And they would be looking towards the Pennsylvania side of um, their camp. And he says, I don't mean to alarm you, but do you see the eye shine out there? And she says, yeah, what, what is that, Jesse? And, you know, he's like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think we're okay. We're, we're fine. We've never been, never had anything happen. You know, let's just, if, if by chance it, it starts coming closer and it, it acts in a, uh, a violent way, get in the back with our son, I'll close you guys in there and we'll drive out of here and I'll come back the next day for everything that we left. I'll quick throw the water from the bucket on the fire and we're gone. So nothing happens that from that point till they go to bed, nothing. Um, they see it kind of move back and forth every once in a while. They don't see it and then pop the eyes are there again, um, almost like it blinked or it, it moved and watched something else, whatever. They go to bed. About an hour and a half, maybe two hours into uh, them finally zonking off, uh, his wife wakes him up. <clears throat> because she can hear some kind of movement outside in their camp area. And th they can hear, or she can hear this kind of heavy panting. Um, he explained it to a dog on a hot summer's day panting. But if that dog was in a kind of an echoey room, it was very loud, and it, wherever it was, because it had been on like one side, they could hear it walking at different locations of their small little camp setup that they had. Um, But it seemed like this panting noise was right on top of them. Um, like it would be 20, 25, 30 feet from their tent. And then, you know, five minutes later, 15 feet behind their tent, which would put it closer to the truck. But it still sounded the same. The panting still sounded the same. Like it was right on top of them. He yells out, you know, yeah, yeah, get out of here. Thinking it's coyote. Um, 
or this large wolf-like dog thing that his wife saw. They don't hear it. They don't hear any noise. They hear, they kind of hear like this scuttle and nothing. So he's tired. She's tired. He falls asleep like the typical man, he said. And um, of course, she stays up listening just to make sure, you know, she's in mama bear mode at this point. And uh, she doesn't hear anything. So they event they're both now asleep and morning hits. They get out of their tent and he starts looking around the campsite um, for prints. Like, I want to see these, if it is coyote or whatever, I would like to see their paw prints. And of course they they check on their son and he's still asleep. You know, they got up at like six. They're, they're up early because they were, you know, scared. Um, when he finds the tracks, they are about the size of a medium sized skillet, you know, like a, what a 10 inch skillet. Um, he covers kind of them up with sand from the ground and doesn't say anything to his wife. Just, you know, let's, this is, we've got today, tonight, and we're leaving tomorrow morning, afternoon. Let's enjoy the last day and night of our trip. Cause it's going to be a while before I get any more free time. And, um, he had contracts and stuff. Like I said, he did odd jobs. He'd work with garages doing doing work. Um, he had a lot of like land maintenance and stuff. He really at the time was a, a kind of a jack of all trades and, and teaching himself as he went along. Um, whatever he hadn't learned from, you know, older relatives and stuff. So He just wants the, you know, to make the best of the day. And little boy gets up, has breakfast. Um, what are we doing today again, Dad? What are we doing again? Yada, yada. You know how little kids are. So the plan of the day was to go fishing and, um, you know, have mom come. Have a kind of a fish dinner tonight. Eat what they catch. Just have a good night. Have a good day and a good last night. Um, something, you know, they, they kind of have a routine of what they did every year. Uh, they end up going up. He makes the worst decision of his life at this point. And... Um, his wife is set on one side of the creek because if you go down by where their truck is and their, their camp is, you can cross over pretty easily um, and then follow the creek with the other, you know, him and his son on the other side um, so she can watch them and still be close to camp. They go on the other side there and he sets his son up on this like little kind of crook in the creek um and he's probably a good 100 feet from his son his wife's right across you know no less or no more than 50 feet and they're all fishing um, they can communicate, talk, yell, you know, the little boy yells, I got something, I got something. And, you know, the day went on like that. And, uh, about an hour before they were going to call it quits, 
they're just the wife is now calm because there hadn't been any kind of anything strange it's almost like everything was just falling into place for the last good night he casts out and as he casts out he wants to look and see what his son's doing and his son is turned the opposite way his poles on the ground um facing the creek you know he's uh, turned around from the creek but his poles laying just right on the ground he kind of yells hey pick up your pole if you get a bite it's going to drag your pole in the water and you're going to lose your pole and his son doesn't <clears throat> respond and he's just like looking at something kind of moving his head and he looks across the the creek and he sees his wife stand up and start to walk in a way that she could be closer to her son but the creek is separating them and where this creek is it's now deeper and wider and it would take her more time to get to him and he sees this look of fear on her face and he then gets up drops his pole un clips his gun out of his holster and starts to kind of walk because he now sees the wife he's now concerned because her eyes are fixed on their son he can't see because of the, the position the creek goes. And he starts walking towards where his son is. She screams this blood curdling scream. And all you see is this large bipedal dog man come running out of the woods. And it grabs the little boy and <clears throat> picks him up like a football would, like a football player would a ball. Very quickly, the little boy is struggling. He's now running. The wife is running kind of to at a point to meet their kid. No sooner does the dog man have the, the little boy in this kind of scooped position, kind of like holding a football, like a football player would, it then drops to a all four position, but it's now only on three legs, still holding the little boy in the same kind of setting in the crotch of its, you know, arm. And it takes off running. The little boy is screaming. He's yelling. She's screaming. She's, you know, running across the, the, the water. She's, you know, it's deep, not deep, but, you know, four or five feet deep at that point. Maybe 10 feet wide. <clears throat> By the time he was back, he was where their son was standing. This creature was out of sight. And they could hear their son cry, scream for a couple of more, you know, seconds, maybe a minute. And then it was dead silent. Just dead, dead silent. No wind. No squirrels, not even the creek, he said. He said it, it was almost like time stood still and everything was quiet. His wife, of course, is hysterical. We need to, you know, get our son, get our son, Jesse. What the hell was that? Is he okay? Okay. 
they make the decision to have her take the truck and notify. Once again, it's before cell phones to get somewhere to notify the police department, whoever they need to notify. <clears throat> and he'll stay behind tracking this thing that has his son. Hours go by. Uh, West Virginia State Police are on the scene. Pennsylvania State Police are on the scene. Um, Department of Conservation is on the scene. They've located some tracks. The West Virginia State Trooper, one of the state troopers, comments that that's one hell of a big trap track. Um, you know, what, what the hell did you guys see? Tell us what you saw. And uh, the husband, Jesse, says, I, if I tell you, you're not going to believe me. But I got to tell you because you've seen these tracks. And he tells the story to the West Virginia State State Trooper. He's then pulled aside. Almost, it's almost like the search for the little boy stops for a second. Not just a second, a longer than a second. Because now the State Trooper is like, I don't buy this. Are you on drugs? Are you drinking? Were you drinking? This, this, and that. Let's talk to your wife. Carol proceeds to say, word for word, what happened? Now, the state trooper has already spoken to the Pennsylvania State Trooper, and it's like they're looking at these parents like they did something wrong. So, about an hour goes by. We need to find our son. We need to figure out what you did to your son first, is said. They're brought to the police station. There's still people searching. Department of Conservation, Ohio State Police, and West Virginia, or not Ohio, excuse me, Pennsylvania State Police. West Virginia. And they're back at, you know, a station getting questioned like they did something to their son. Probably dark now. There's a call over the radio. They found the little boy. I won't get into details, but he was not alive. He partially consumed. Um, a lot of soft tissue was consumed. And... Um, A lot of weird tracks around the body. And the Pennsylvania State Police are communicating with the West Virginia State Police. You know, like, we've never seen anything like this. This is horrendous. There's no way a human could do this to another human, let alone a father and mother do this to their son. This is gruesome. The wife is hysterical. She is then brought to the hospital and put on a 72 hour psych hold by the West Virginia State Police. 
He's handcuffed and brought to the location. The body's not there because by then they had already moved the body. And it was almost like torture for this man. He kept repeating what he saw. It came from the woods. It grabbed my son. It scooped him up and cradled him in one arm and dropped to three legs because one had my son in it and ran away. So imagine this. Your wife has now been committed by the West Virginia State Police on a psych hold. And you are handcuffed, put in a room, unable to see your son, unable to, the last thing you saw was this creature grab him. And five or six hours later, two gentlemen come in in nondescript clothing, like khaki pants and like a kind of a flannelish button up tucked in. And proceed to question Jesse for hours. What did you see? What did it look like? Where did it run to? Where were you? Where was your wife? This, this, and that. Difference between these two men questioning him than the state trooper that was questioning him was he got the feeling like these men knew what the hell was going on? They go. Apparently, he doesn't know after the questioning is done. They then go to the hospital. He doesn't know this at the time. He's only, you know, he's piecing this together after all of this and talks to the wife. And. They come back and say, listen, your son was taken by a black bear. He was mauled. It's an unfortunate accident. And if you say anything other than what you are told right now, we will make it look like you did this. We will tell the public that you are an alcoholic, that you abused your wife and abused your son prior to, and you killed him, and you will go to jail. You will go to prison. Unless you go along with the story we are telling you what happened. Your son was taken, mauled by a bear. You had a 22, and you couldn't stop it. He couldn't deal with what was going on and had to go along with saying that a bear did this to his son because he was afraid for his wife's safety and her mental well-being. And he wanted answers, but no one was giving him answers. Nobody said what this thing was. Nobody said who they were. The men that interviewed him did not provide credentials, did not share names, In 1997, his wife took a 
fatal dose of sleeping pills, followed by a large amount of alcohol. And he has been alone since 1997. He has since moved almost six, seven hundred miles to an undisclosed location. Um, that he doesn't want me to share. He doesn't even want me to say the name of the state. But, uh, yeah. And that is why he didn't like me. <laughs> because he thought <clears throat> that because of the shall we, and because I had, you know, uh, an upbeat kind of personality that I didn't take it serious until, you know, years later. And he realized that, you know, I did and a few other channels did. But he's disgusted with, like, the whole research and the whole everything. And he doesn't trust the government anymore. And uh, it took him 30-something years to share this with somebody other than his family. His son was cremated without his and his wife's consent. He was just told. And it's just disgusting what these law enforcement officials, whether it be state, federal, did to him and his family. It's even worse when you add up the thing that he doesn't have his son and now his wife. That was Jesse's encounter. That was Jesse's experience. So talking to him at the end of all this, um, I really enjoyed talking with him uh, about everything that happened. And he relayed a lot of information and um you know it, it was it was funny that he despised me because of the whole shall we thing um and now like we talked for four hours and uh just a really nice guy a really amazing person. He has since gone to that location. Uh, he has, like I said, moved out of that area. Uh, takes him about a day from where he lives now to get to Marshall County where everything happened, but, um, yeah, it's an unbelievable and disgusting experience that what they did to him, what they did to his wife, you know, and the saddest thing that he said to me during that conversation wasn't the fact that his that he lost his son and later lost his wife the thing that made him break down the worst was that 
his son, it's almost like his son will never be remembered because it was blocked out of history. There was no news write up. There was nothing. He almost said that he wishes that he disagreed with what they said. Because at least that way, his son's memory would be, you know, um, there would be some sort of mention of his son's passing. Even if it meant that he looked like he was the perpetrator of it. It, it just, it was really sad. I, I, <laughs> I wasn't ready for, for that conversation. Um, that's for sure. But I am glad that I had it because I, I made a new friend and, um, I hope it helped him. I really do. I told him, you know, if you ever, if you ever need to talk, text me, I'll text you back. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's crazy. It is crazy. Anyway, um, <laughs> wow, guys, thank you for supporting this channel. Your support is really what makes this channel so special and really what makes it special for people like him, people like Jesse to, to come on and, you know, share with me to share with you because he knows that there won't be any judgment. He's doesn't live in fear today of the dogmen or the government. He just doesn't want to, you know, he, he just doesn't want to share his location of where he is because he, he doesn't live in fear. He, he lives in distrust of them. So even though he, he, he and I both know that there is a digital mark for anyone that uses the internet, but I don't know. <laughs> Poor guy. Wow. Uh, I don't even know what else to say. I, I got to end this. So I just, I'm just, I, after the upload or yeah, after me and him talking and then me recording this, it was just, I had to make coffee. I had to sit down. I, hugged both my daughters can't imagine what it'd be like to lose a child like that but you know the craziest thing about that whole thing is how the dog man took him took his child like a, a sack of potatoes or a football just crouched in his arm you know, like a running back would run with a football, but then it dropped and it was only using three arms while holding his son. Damn these things. Guys, please stay safe. Please stay happy and healthy and ever vigilant. Please keep an eye on our children. Our, I say our because... They are our future, our pets, our family and friends. Share a little bit of information that we share with each other, with those that you love and care about, and it may just save their life someday. God bless you all.